We're thankful to be here. I, I'm taking a chance this morning and giving a report on um, the ministry we had in Israel in February, um, this past February. I know I probably have a lot of mistakes that our brother, Dr. Hartman, will correct um, as far as details, but I'm really excited about what God did during that time. I'm going to share this morning at this hour a little bit about that from a biblical perspective um, and what was going on in, in my mind during that time. Um, and just to see how, you know, God worked things out in, in, a, in a miraculous way. And that's why I say what to do when you don't know what to do, because we didn't know what to do. <laughs> Um, but um, God obviously did. So um, and so we want to look at really from a perspective of two events in the Bible, kind of uh, put them together with what was going on at that time of ministry. This was back in February of 2024. We had been planning to go to Israel, to actually the West Bank, the northern part of the West Bank, uh, for uh, probably almost a year. We've been planning that. And um, it was coming up, um, and we were planning to leave February 13th. And you all know what happened on October 7th. And so, um, you know, we were concerned about that, but we, I didn't really think by February th that would still be a problem. <laughs> but obviously, it's still a problem today. Um, and so uh, it went on a lot longer than I think anybody had had uh, anticipated, and it impacted our ministry uh, in February. Um, and so you read the passage. Let's, let's look at Acts, tw Acts uh, chapter 12 for a minute. You read <clears throat> about that account there in Acts chapter 12, and what happened really um, as we were preparing to go was something that it reminded me so much of this passage that I, I couldn't really get it out of my mind. So um, what to do when you don't know what to do. And so you saw that the people were praying for Peter, that he was in prison. They were afraid that he was going to die and they were praying for him. Um, and um, he was being held captive and in verse seven and behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him and a light shined in the prison and he smote Peter on the side and raised him up saying, arise up quickly. And his chains fell off from his hands. So <clears throat> Peter was miraculously released from this prison as the people were praying for him. And it's interesting, they, they were praying for him and God was answering their prayer. They didn't know it though. They were still praying. They were in this room praying. In verse eight, and the angel said unto him, gird thyself and bind on thy sandals. And so he did, and he saith unto him, cast thy garment about thee and follow me. And so he went out. In verse 11, when Peter was come to himself, he said, now I know for of a surety that the Lord hath sent his angel and hath delivered me out of the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the people of the Jews. And in verse 13, and as Peter knocked at the door of the gate where the people were gathered together praying for him, a damsel came to hearken named Rhoda. And when she, she, when she knew Peter's voice, she opened not the gate for gladness but ran in and told how Peter stood before the gate. <clears throat> she was not expecting Peter to be there. No one was. No one was. Verse 15, and they said unto her, thou art mad. But she constantly affirmed that it was even so. Then said they, it is an angel. But Peter continued knocking. The poor guy, he's been in prison. You know, he's knocking at the door, <laughs> let me in. He continued knocking, and when they opened the door and saw him, they were what? Astonished. But he, beckoning unto them with a hand to hold their peace, declared unto them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And so Peter was miraculously um, rescued from the prison in answer to the people's prayers. 
they were astonished or beside themselves, I like to think. And so sometimes we, as Christians, pray with the same kind of, we'll say, weak faith. We pray sometimes because we know it's something we should be doing. But it's not always praying, believing that God can answer that prayer. We know the verses in our Bible, Luke chapter 1, verse 37, <clears throat> excuse me, says, Therefore, with God, nothing shall be impossible. I think we put a lot of restrictions on God when we pray in our minds. This problem is too hard. This problem has been going on for too long. Nothing can, nothing can change this. Luke chapter 18, verse 27, the things which are impossible with men are possible with God. Mark chapter 9, verse 23, all things are possible to him that believeth. All things. In Genesis 18, verse 14, is anything too hard for the Lord? We have to have that mindset as Christians. Is anything too hard for the Lord? In Jeremiah 32, verse 17, it says, There, Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heaven and the earth by thy great power and stretched out arm, and there is nothing too hard for thee. I wonder today if we really believe these verses. In our daily walk with the Lord, do we really, really believe these verses? That nothing is impossible with God. That God can change anything if he wants to. And so <clears throat> that was where we were <clears throat> trying to figure out what to do. We had a team of seven people planning to depart from Boston on the evening of February 13th. This was going to be our third opportunity to serve uh, in that part of the world. And so leading up to that time, February 13th, we had a lot of obstacles that we were trying to um, go through and putting the team together, how it was going to go, where it was going to be, and all of these things. And we were waiting now to see what would happen as far as the war situation. So unfortunately, as February 13th were, was approaching, there seemed to be no end in sight in the war. Uh, the ministry was um, going to be too dangerous in the West Bank. And so we were all praying. We were praying in um, the U.S. People in Israel were praying that God would give us wisdom as to what to do. I remember talking a number of times to Dr. Hartman about, you know, what, what we should do. And we kind of came to a, a time where we were <clears throat> focusing on a, a point in time where we were going to make a decision as to whether or not to go. And so in my mind, as I remember things, we were about a couple of days away from that date of making that decision. And also in my mind, the, the answer was going to be no, we're not going to go because we had no other option. Uh, in place. So what happened next, that's this is what reminded me of this passage in Acts chapter 12. When the woman and others were praying for Peter's release from prison and God answered their prayer, they were so surprised that they wouldn't even open the door for him. They were not expecting to happen. And sometimes that's the way, again, that we pray. When I take teams on, on some of these trips, I, I love to see how God answers specific prayers as we're in the, in the, involved in ministry in real time. It's so exciting to pray about something and see God answer it right away. And as I was thinking about this, there were two things that came to my, to my mind, two examples that came to my mind about this. And one was, we had a team going to the, the country of Zambia in Africa several years ago now, probably three or four years ago, during the time of COVID. And so we had a group of, of people gathered again in Boston at the airport. We were getting ready to, to check in from our, for our flight to Zambia. And um, one of the young men um, sent me a text in the airport and he said, they won't let us check in. And so I was not there. So I said, I will, I'll be right there. So 
again, during that time, you remember COVID, they were saying, the airline was saying that we needed to have proof that uh, of, a, of a negative COVID test. And they were saying you had to have proof of having been vaccinated. Two things, negative test and the vaccination. According to the airlines, uh, to the um, website of the country of Zambia, you only needed to have a negative test. You did not have to have the vaccine. And so I was trying to convince the lady at the desk, this is not correct what you're saying. And she was like adamant. This is what my paper says. You need these two things. And I said, please, will you check with someone else? Check with the website of the country of Zambia. She said, she was like, you know, <laughs> you think I don't know what I'm doing type of thing. And I said, please check. She said, well, will you people stand over there. So we stood over there and I said, let's pray. And so we prayed as a group right there, almost beside the counter where she was um, to the check-in counter. I finished the prayer. I said, amen, and looked up and the lady was calling us to the counter. And she said, you're all set to go. You just need a negative test. And we all had the negative test. God answers prayer. And sometimes he answers it so quick that we're so astonished by that. Um, it, it, takes our, it takes away, I mean, it, it, it takes us by surprise. And so I love to see how uh, God does that with, with some of our groups. We were in the country of Micronesia. We just came back from Micronesia, Micronesian islands near the country of Guam. Guam is actually part of the United States. The Micronesian islands are part of the United States. We were just there, but... A number of years ago, we were on a very small island um, in Micronesia. It was very flat at sea level, um, not too many people inhabiting that island. And we had to be flown to that island on a small mission airplane. And we were scheduled to depart on a particular day. And we got word by satellite phone from the pilot that he was not going to be able to pick us up the next day because there was a typhoon heading for that island. And here we are on this island, no way to get off. And fortunately, we were in a cement building, uh, but the island itself was at sea level. <laughs> There's no, no mountains, no high ground to go to or anything. So we prayed and went, and went to bed, <laughs> nothing we could do. We get up in the morning and the sky was cloudy it was drizzling a little bit, but there was calmness. And we got a, another satellite phone message from the pilot, and he said, be at the airstrip in 40 minutes. And we were like, <laughs> not prepared for that at all. And so we came to the airstrip at 40 minutes, and he showed us a printout of the storm. What happened during the night was the storm split in two and the the way for him to fly from where he was in um uh, i was going to say in guam but he wasn't in guam yeah, yeah. <laughs> of course you know where yap is but <laughs> where he was there to where we were that was the only clear place he could fly so he just flew and picked us up and flew back um, again, amazing answer to prayer in real time, you know. Sometimes we pray for things for a long time, though, right? And we wonder, does God even hear this prayer? But God doesn't answer all our prayers right away. And um, But we have to understand that God could answer our prayers right away. And he will answer our prayers if we're praying according to his will. So we were praying. And I won't tell you, I was praying with a lot of belief, honestly, because it just seemed impossible that we were going to be able to go um, on this trip. So out of nowhere, I get this call from Dr. Hartman that his son Grant, who you know, um, had uh, 
had some Chinese friends in his church, and they had found out that these all, all these Chinese men were in Israel without medical care and would be, be interested in going. And so I said, yes, let's go. This is a crazy idea, but let's do it. So we need to also be prepared for God to answer our prayers in unusual ways. A number of years ago, our our son was uh, at a point in his life where he, he figured there's no way he was ever going to get married. He was at the ripe old age of about 24. And he's like, there's no way I'm ever going to get married. I don't have a girlfriend. There's no girls my age in my church. and Nothing's going to happen. And um, so we had a speaker come to our church. And the speaker met our son and was talking with our son and and you know, I was asking him, do you have a girlfriend and that kind of stuff? And our son shared, no. Do you have any prospects? No. And all of this. And this man said to him, I have someone for you. You know, and our son was, you know, he just rolled his eyes. You know, how many people have said that to him along the way? And I'm sure some of you uh that's happened to. I have someone for you. And our son was like, no way. You know, so this man went back to his where he worked and he um, told his secretary, I have someone for you. And he gave his secretary our son's email address and she threw it away. She was of the same opinion, you know, <laughs> <laughs> this is not going to work and throw it away. And so, um, but I was having trouble <clears throat> with my uh, email at one point in time. I am, I am not very technological. Um, I can barely type on my computer. And so my I, we were trying to send out our newsletter and I couldn't get it to send on my computer. So I asked my son, could you send the newsletter on your computer? So he sent it through his email address and it went to this man. And so he now had my son's email address and he brings it to his secretary and he says, sit down. I want to dictate a letter. So he starts to dictate a letter as if she was writing to our son. <laughs> She's like, I am not going to do this. So anyway, um, what happened was we had a, a special speaker again come to our church, a different person. And this man was talking about prayer and being aware that God can answer our prayers in unusual ways. And our son is sitting there like, um, as, as if, you know, God was saying to him, you need to write this girl. <laughs> um, and he's like, because he had been praying, you know, God, I, you know, I, I would like to get married. And so after that message, he said, well, I'll send her my testimony of salvation. So he did that. and She got it from him. And she said, OK, I'll send him my testimony of salvation. And the next thing you know, they're married. So, you know, so God can answer our prayers in unusual ways. And I thought of that story about our son with the trip to Israel. God had answered our prayer in such an unusual way. You would never think that. So at this time, now we had a plan. But February 13th was now only a few weeks away. A lot of things had to go into place. We we didn't have to do a whole lot, but uh, Dr. Hartman and his son and others in Israel had to do a lot of work to kind of put something together for us to go. Um, but I often say, you know, when God is in something, we just have to stand back and watch him work. And it was just amazing how God worked in this situation. So I want to look at another passage in, in, in our Bibles in Exodus chapter 14. I call this a standstill moment. And this is where we were in our planning to go. We were at a standstill moment. So Exodus chapter 14, you know the story. You could probably tell me the story uh, yourselves. But Exodus chapter 14, we want to read from um, verse 1 to 22. Exodus 14. The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they turn and encamp before Pihahiroth, between Migdal and the sea, and against Baal-Zephon, 
before it shall before it shall ye encamp by the sea for pharaoh will say of the children of israel they are entangled in the land the wilderness has shut them shut them in and i will harden pharaoh's heart and he shall follow after them and i will be honored upon pharaoh and upon all his hosts that the egyptians may know that i am the lord and they did so and it was told the king of Egypt that the people fled, and the heart of Pharaoh and all his servants was turned against the people. And they said, Why have we done this, that we have let Israel go from serving us? And he made ready his chariot and took his people with them. And he took 600 chosen chariots and all the chariots of Israel and captains over every one of them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued after the children of Israel. And the children of Israel went out with a high hand. But the Egyptians pursued after them, all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh and his horsemen and his army, and overtook them and camping, and camping by the sea beside Pihiroth before Beelzephon. And when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them, and they were sore afraid. And the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord, and they said unto Moses, because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt thus with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? Is not this the word that we, we did tell thee in, in Egypt, saying, Let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he shall, will show to you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you shall see them again no more forever. The Lord shall fight for you, and ye shall hold your peace. And we know what happened as the Lord directed Moses to raise his staff, and the sea parted, and the, Egypt, and the Israelites went across on dry ground, and then the Egyptians pursuing them were all engulfed in the sea as it came back on them. A standstill moment. Moses was told, told the people to fear not, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show you today. And so this is where we were, because like those praying, like those praying, um, we were prepared to go, but February 13th in Boston was predicted to be a huge snowstorm. So this is the news that we got. As we now have a plan in place, we're trying to get ready to go. We're leaving on February 13th. The weather forecast for Boston was 12 to 16 inches of snow. And it wasn't just a, maybe this is going to happen. Everyone, every news station was predicting Boston is going to get hit with an amazing snowstorm, 12 to 16 inches of snow. When it snows in New England, it rarely snows in Boston because it's right there on the coast and the warm ocean water keeps the snow away. So, it, they, you know, a big snowstorm for them is usually about five or six inches or something like that. To have a storm 12 to 16 inches was very unusual. There were actually, that day, February 13th, 600 flights canceled going in and out of Boston. Our flight was at, scheduled to go at 8.30. So for some reason, it was still scheduled. And so my wife and I said, we, we need to get to Boston early <laughs> just in case um, there's a way that we can work this out we didn't know what to do it seemed impossible impossible that we would go out that night all we could do was what pray pray and wait and see what god would do now again i was praying but at the same time i was praying i was waiting for the news that our flight was canceled it's really hard for us to pray when things look so bad to pray believing that this is going to happen. 
we need to trust God with these kinds of things. It's not always easy to do. So if we didn't get on that flight to, to Israel that night, things would disrupt the whole schedule that, that Dr. Hartman, that Grant were putting together. And so it was, it was like these Israelites. We were saying to God, I was saying to God, why did you bring this, you know, to us to this point where now we have a plan to go and now you bring the snowstorm and it's going to stop us from going. So we were waiting there. And so we had people coming from different parts of the country to fly into Boston that day, February 13th. One couple from Colorado, one from South Carolina, uh, Yusef from somewhere, I forget where, Pennsylvania. I don't know where he is. Anyway, so, so we, were, we were there. My wife and I were waiting. I'm on the phone with all of these people all day, you know, trying that the people coming from, from Colorado, their flight was changed, I don't know how many times, three or four times, but they made it to Boston. The people from Greenville had to change, I think, just one time. And they made it to Boston. And Yusef also made it to Boston. But we were still <laughs> waiting for news that the flight was canceled. But it never was canceled. Why was it never canceled? Look, like those... Um, that we're praying for Peter. We were praying, but we had no hope that this was going to turn out to be right. And so we prayed and waited, and it never snowed in Boston. Not one flake of snow. That was unbelievable. That's why I call it a standstill moment. I pictured God standing still on the runway in Boston, keeping the snow away. You know, it was just in my mind, it's like, there's no way this storm cannot come. But God rules over the land and the sea. So God was at work. We didn't know. It wasn't snowing in Boston. We were there for most of the day. It was not snowing in Boston. We kept waiting for it to snow. Evening came, but the snow didn't come. Our flight was not canceled. It took off as planned. And we had an amazing ministry. Souls were saved. How did it happen? Only God. Only God. Praise the Lord for that. There's another standstill moment in our Bible that one that has encouraged me a lot along the way. I want us to look at that in Second Chronicles chapter 20. Second Chronicles chapter 20. You're probably familiar with the story, the account of, of uh, Jehoshaphat in Second Chronicles. I know Second Chronicles is in my Bible somewhere. Second Chronicles chapter 20. We're just going to break into the story at verse 12 here. But Jehoshaphat was under uh, attack from, from a multitude of, of enemy uh, people. We'll just read it, verses 1 and 2 of chapter 20. It came to pass after this also that the children of Moab, children of Ammon, and, and with them others beside the Ammonites, came against Jehoshaphat to battle. Then there came some that told Jehoshaphat, saying, There cometh a great multitude against thee from beyond the sea on this side Syria. And behold, they be in Haz Hazazon Tamar, which is in Gedi. And again, Jehoshaphat, verse 3, did the right thing. Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. What do you do when you don't know what to do? You pray. You pray. And that's what he did. He got all the people to pray. And he's pleading with God as he, he's praying. And then in verse 12, he says, Oh, our God, wilt thou not judge them, these people that are coming against us? These are the same people, in fact, that the Israelites went around when they came out of Egypt after they crossed the Red Sea. They went around them instead of going through them. And now he's saying, Jehoshaphat is saying, they're rewarding us this way. Now they're going to come against us. But in verse 12, O oh, our God, wilt thou not judge them? For we have no might against this great company that come against us. 
neither know we what to do, but our eyes are upon thee. What do you do when you don't know what to do? You need to turn to the Lord. Our eyes are upon you. And that's what I say. I, I, I paraphrase this part of the verse, for we have no might against this great company that cometh against us, neither know we what to do. I say I'm not strong enough, and I'm not smart enough. <laughs> I need God. I need God's direction. I need God's help in deciding what to do in problems that come up in our lives. Sometimes we have overwhelming problems in our lives, and we, we can't figure out in our own minds how this problem can be solved. Years ago, and I told you this story before, <clears throat> my own testimony, my wife, we were married in 1974, praise the Lord, 50 years ago um, in June, we celebrated our 50th wedding anniversary. We were saved, we, my wife was saved around that same time, but I was not saved for 14 years after that. During that time, my wife felt God directing her to be a missionary. And she's like saying, how can this happen that I could be a missionary? My husband's not even saved yet. And so she's praying for that. I didn't want to have anything to do with the Lord during that time. But I had a faithful wife who was praying for me. And the Lord brought many obstacles in my life uh, during that time. And it culminated in 1987, where um, I was uh, joining a partnership with another dentist. We were spending a lot of money uh, taking two spaces in an office building and breaking down the wall and joining the two spaces together. We we're spending over $200,000, which back then 1987 was a lot more money than <clears throat> we really <laughs> had and then we also i was also being sued for nine million dollars by a, a, a woman that worked for me in our office and she had a problem with her back she was out of work for about a year with the back problem and she all of a sudden decided it was my fault saying that the carpeting in the office wasn't maintained and she was on a, a sitting on a chair that had wheels and one of the wheels caught in a ripple in the carpet and, and she wrenched her back and that was my fault but the carpet was fine they had people coming in laying on the floor taking pictures of the carpet trying to find ripples in the carpet it was crazy but nine million dollars is a lot of money <laughs> and i'm like how can this happen and what can I do about it, you know? And um, so anyway, that was happening, I was spending all this money. And then I was also thinking at that time that perhaps my wife would come to the point when she would have enough and leave her and the kids. And if she did, it would be my fault. But um, praise the Lord, you know, God just, um, brought these things to me so that I would listen to him. My wife had shared the gospel with me a number of times during that 14-year period. But I can honestly stand here today and say I never heard the gospel. I never heard it in my heart. I heard it in my head, but never in my heart. God used these things to prepare my heart to hear the gospel. March 27, 1987, I was saved that day. Still had a $9 million lawsuit. And you know what happened? God took it away. He took it away. I got a call from a lawyer. He said it was thrown out of court shortly after I was saved. Why was that lawsuit brought against me? It was to get me saved. God brought it, something that was in our eyes really bad. God used it for what? Good. Oftentimes, trials come into our life and we look at them and say, nothing good can ever come of this. 
nothing good. Do we believe, do we believe that God is in control of our lives? Do we believe that God wants good for us? We need to be trusting God with our lives. We got to this place in, in the, the, the Israel ministry. And I, I tell you, that was the longest, probably the longest day of my life was in that airport waiting for the snow to come and, and you know, the flight to be canceled. But it never happened. And God's ministry, God's ministry in Israel ended up being not only the Chinese workers, but the Bedouins and the people in the West Bank far beyond what we had imagined the ministry to be. We had the opportunity to reach three restricted groups of people. I cannot go to China to have ministry like this. They won't let us go. They won't give us um, permission to do medical down care in China. I can't do this ministry there. God brought these Chinese men to Israel <laughs> so they could hear the gospel. Isn't that something? Who would have planned that? Only God. Only God. And uh, I'll share some pictures in the afternoon uh, service. But we had this ministry to, to these groups of people that was unbelievable. So what do you do when you don't know what to do? Three things to try to remember. First one is the power of prayer. We need to be praying, believing. Pray believing that God can change the situation. <clears throat> I ran across this quote from Charles Spurgeon. He says, prayer is the slender nerve that moves the muscle of omnipotence. The slender nerve that moves the muscle of omnip omnip omnipotence. Prayer. There's power in prayer. And I think the second thing to remember, particularly when we're involved in ministry, is that we are engaged in a spiritual battle. I believe that the devil, Satan, did not want us to go to Israel in February. And he was doing everything he could to hinder that ministry. We have to be aware of the spiritual battle. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. They're beyond us. We don't understand it. And we see it very often in our ministry. And we also have to remember the sovereignty of God. God is in control. He's in control of everything. He's in control of the land and the sea. He's in control of the snow. I mean, everything. God is in control. God is in control of countries. God is in control of leaders in countries. God is in control of this election coming up, isn't he? The sovereignty of God. We have to understand that God is in control. And as we understand that God is in control, I think it makes, us, makes it easier for us to pray believing. Understanding that God is not only sovereign, but he has the power to change anything. As Second Chronicles says, we don't have the strength. God is the strength and God is the wisdom. And so later on in that passage in, in, in Second Chronicles, the prophet came to, to uh, Jehoshaphat and said, Hearken ye, verse 15 in Second Chronicles 20, all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem and now King Jehoshaphat, Thus says the Lord unto you, be not afraid nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude. For what? <laughs> the battle is not yours, but God's. It's something for us to remember in our lives, mm -hmm. isn't it? The battle is not ours, but God's. Tomorrow, he says, go ye down against them. Behold, they are come up by the cliff of Ziz, and ye shall find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jerul. I often, when I read that verse, I say, Jehoshaphat had no idea where this multitude was. But God gives specific directions of exactly where they are. God knows all things. 
God is aware of what's going on. And so he tells them, but in verse 17, he says, you shall not need to fight in this battle. Set yourselves, stand ye still, and see the salvation of the Lord. Much the same as what was said at Exodus chapter 14. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord will be with you. They didn't even have to fight in this battle, as the Lord said. The enemy killed themselves, it turns out. And they won a great victory here. So praise the Lord. As we come across, so as we come <clears throat> across difficulties in our lives, sometimes they come by surprise. They take us by surprise. Everything's going fine. They take us by surprise, and we kind of lose sight sometimes of these things about God that we need to reach out to God and ask him to help us in this situation. Give us wisdom. Give us strength. And God can do it because he's a sovereign God, all-powerful God, and he's on our side as we trust in Jesus Christ as our Savior. So it's really hard for me to express the um, feelings that we had in February regarding this ministry. I, I don't know how many trips that we have taken. I think I mentioned this before, but I say that this is the ministry that we saw the hand of God involved in the, in the biggest way in the ministry. God directing our steps, putting the ministry together and, and bringing people to us to hear the gospel and people getting saved. It was amazing what God does. We cannot ever underestimate what God can do in our lives.